Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Noin. I am Director of Communications and Events at Squeezed. I welcome all of you who joined us today for our brown back session with Admire Bioinnovations with our speaker and panelist, Dr. Eddie Dolahan. I will introduce her a moment later. First, I would like to give land acknowledgements. We would like to take a moment and reflect our connection to the land and thank the traditional guardians of that land, which we at Squeezed Vancouver live and work. Vancouver is on the unceded ancestral and traditional lands of Musqueam, Slewadu, Seashell, and Squamish, and indigenous people of Turtles Island. With that note, I would like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Eddie Dallan. She is scientific director of Admare Academy at Admare Bioinnovations Vancouver. As the scientific director of Admare Academy, she plays a direct role in the development and advancement of scientific talent within the Canadian life sciences ecosystem. At Admare, Dr. Dallan supports the Academy's program, including the bioinnovation scientific Pro program, scientist program, that about which you will hear today. Previously, Dr. Delahan worked at CDRD, which is the Center for Drug Research and Development as the Director of Target Validations, where she spent over 10 years advancing Made in Canada innovations. Dr. Delahan obtained her PhD in uh, UK at the National Institute of Medical Research. With that note, I will leave the floor to Dr. Eddie Delahan. Thanks for being with us today. And uh, you were with us in the last session too. And it was really amazing, informative. And I hope that our all attendees uh, can get some information from today's session too. With that note, thanks again. And I will leave the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you, Noreen. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And hello to everybody. Um, I'm so happy to be here to talk to you about Admare, who we are, what we do, uh, what our mandate is, what we are tasked to do by the federal government. And predominantly today, I'm going to be talking about the Bioinnovation Scientist Program. So what do we do? Basically, Admare is building Canada's life sciences industry from sea to sea. We build companies by partnering at, with and investing in technology in, in innovators and entrepreneurs. And so if you know anything about us, there's constant an announcements of the different companies that we've been involved with. Some of them, I was involved in the early scientific endeavors. So it's really exciting to me to see that these companies actually go out into the Canadian life sciences landscape and, and do very well. The other thing we do is we build ecosystems. And this is based around physical infrastructure. So right now, we are, I'm here in the Vancouver Centre. We also have a centre in Montreal. We're looking very closely at developing other centres. I think the next centre is likely to be in Toronto. The other thing we do, and it, the bit that I'm the most involved with, is we build talent. And I can tell you that... Uh, when I talk to people from numerous companies, I've spoken to directors from Sanofi, from Pfizer, and they have said to me, the pain point, the main pain point in Canada is accessing the, the people that they need to drive life sciences in Canada. And I think that that was initially a surprise to me. It's not the scientific ideas. It's not the innovation. It's not even the money. And I can tell you that when I was first involved in biotech, it was all about the money. We don't have the money. But now we do have the money. But what we don't have, we don't have the people that can actually join the company and, and, and drive us going forward. Another thing that I wanted to point out about um, Admare is that we have developed an online digital community that is open to all of you. And I would really like to see some of you sign up. Um, it's, it's an online community where we post every week everything that's happening in the Canadian life sciences. You want to stay up to date. You want to know what companies are, you, are doing. You want to know what new companies are around. You want to know what opportunities are available for you. We have a job board on there with upward of 200 positions posted. 
all Admare positions are posted on there. But as well, when I've looked in, there's Abcellera, Zymeworks, right across the country, different potential uh, opportunities. If we have a postdoc position, that is the first place that it's posted. So it's really, really important. And I think one of the things that we're all learning in our new COVID world is that we need to learn how to interact with each other. I think that I don't know about any of you. I have days where I've been on screen all day. By the end of the day, I'm exhausted because I haven't actually seen a live human being. And that's one of the reasons I've started coming back into the office because I need to see people. But I also need to network and interact with people and the community actually has been a great way to do that. But what is the Admare Academy? Well, actually, there is actually four academies, and, and I just want to mention the others apart from the Bioinnovation Scientist Program. So our undergraduate institute is really our co-op program. And I would say that if I was looking to do a co-op, I would be beating down the door to get in here because here you get eight months of hands-on lab skills, but with a real industrial bent to them. So that you really spend that eight months starting to understand how biotechnology works, how we develop drugs, what is important to know, what kind of skills should I be developing so that I can transition and enter a career that way. We also have the uh, postdoctoral program, and this is a two year intensive fellowship where our, our postdocs learn to work with some of our biotech companies. They hold some of the uh, programs that are being run on behalf of those companies. They get to present data. They get to become familiar with how you manage a project, how you manage people. And these are skills that will carry you through your entire degree. We also have an executive institute. This is a 10 month custom designed executive development program. And I will say we've had great postdocs and now I'm starting to see some of those postdocs in our executive institute. I've interviewed them, they have said the the postdoc that they did enabled them to establish a career in biotech, and they're now rising through the ranks and they're back doing the Executive Institute. I think if that doesn't speak to the quality of our postdoc program, I have a slide later on that I will show you that discusses a little bit more about that. So what I want to talk about now is the Bioinnovation Scientist Program. This is an asynchronous online program. It's not in person. It's taken at your own speed, which I think is very important. And the purpose of it is to transition an academically trained scientist with tons of skills that sometimes you don't even realize you've developed into commercially minded scientists. So that when you go for that, um, job interview in biotech, they realize that you understand the language that they speak because it is different. And I know that when I first started working in biotechnology, I had a lot of misconceptions. Um, one of the talks that we had at Biocanorex today was from Merck, where he said people think it's joining the dark side. It's not joining the dark side, it's joining other scientists that have a real desire to make a difference in the health, not just of Canadians, but of the world. So it's kind of exciting. So the Bioinnovation Scientist Program is very much aligned with our mandate of helping existing companies scale up to drive the growth of those companies into Canadian anchors. And that's by training the next generation of highly qualified personnel. And that HQP has become synonymous. Every, everything I'm reading, it talks about these highly qualified personnel that are needed. And I, I didn't realize actually, when I first got involved with doing some of the curation for this program, I actually didn't know that Canada doesn't have any anchor pharma companies. I just assumed, uh, you know, I emigrated out here and I see that Pfizer's here and GSK is here and Merck and, 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 and big companies like that, but they're from somewhere else. What Admari wants to do is actually get our own anchor companies because Canada has, you know, the greatest research happening 
we should be able to develop these anchor companies. What we did when we were putting together the program, we built it around our postdoc program. And I think that that was a smart thing to do because when I went back and interviewed 15 of our previous postdocs, what was it that worked for them? What was it they learned that really helped them? And we actually really took on board their advice. And these are guys that have gone on to develop really great careers. So the program is delivered across three levels with each level having its own learning objective. And the point being to meet the overarching objective to broaden the perspective, network and crossover skills of junior scientists to accelerate the flow of life science technologies to market. It's a bit of a mouthful and I'll, I'll, I'll delve a little bit more into that in the next slide. So this is what it looks like. We have built it around basic foundational and collaborative skills. That's what you'll find companies term soft skills. You don't necessarily, when you're doing uh, a master's or PhD, they're not there to teach you some of the soft skills. This is something now you need to actually go out and find. And I can tell you that one of the things that uh, I became very aware of, when you're at the bench, your project is your project. How it goes, where it goes, it is all yours. When you join a company, that all goes away. You're now part of a team. Everything you do supports what the greater team is trying to do. And that's when the soft skills become really important. So we chose some foundational skills, things like critical thinking, assertive communication, managing your performance, emotional intelligence, being socially aware. And you actually need these because when I was doing my grad studies on the bench, I could do that without talking to anyone. When you're part of a company, suddenly everything you do has to feed into what the company goals are. So now you have to learn how do you assert yourself without being aggressive? How do you get your point across? How do you stand up in a meeting that may have a hundred present and present your data? These are all things that, you know, can, can be quite intimidating and quite concerning. Also, now you need to collaborate. You want to advance your career. You want to be able to, uh, in a team environment, manage conflict. You also want to become someone as you grow as a scientist to have your own team. So now you need to develop the skills. How, how do you coach your team to higher performance? And I can tell you my experience with that is you have to learn to let other people win other than you. You have to learn to take a step back and let someone else be the focal point so that they get an opportunity to develop their career. And I have to say, I have seen over the years, particularly in, in, in academia, you may have a really forceful PI and he has a large group and that group just works for him. They themselves are not standing up and being able to develop their career. And that's where I wanted to develop a program where you learn how to develop as a leader yourself. And I think that, you know, if you've got a PhD, you've got the skills and the ability to actually generate a career like that. And I've seen that with some of our postdocs. They've gone from being a postdoc to now leading large teams. My first postdoc in CDRD, which was what Admare was called prior to this name change, he's now managing the largest group in stem cell. He is a senior director and has taken the skills that he learned as a postdoc with us and has flown really and that's what you want to see you want to see that people uh, actually leave here and do better than you ever imagined 
when we're talking about biotechnology, we're talking about drug discovery. And so the other part of this is many of us have done PhDs that weren't about drug discovery or drug development. My PhD was uh, looking at innate immunity and tuberculosis. Tuberculosis hides in the very cell designed to kill it. How on earth did it figure that out? So for me, it was a very academic PhD, learning how innate immunity can be overtaken by an infectious disease such that you end up unable to kill this bacteria and lo and behold, it will kill you. We've all seen this during the last uh, 20 months uh, of COVID. In this module, you start to learn what the drug discovery process is. How do you identify a target? How do you screen for compounds against that target? I will say that uh, in, in this drug discovery module, it is heavily leaned towards small molecule, but you know we need to also know and be honest that currently half the drugs going to market are biologics. And so we're hoping to do some updates as time goes by so that we can actually include that in, in that understanding. But also you need to understand the regulatory responsibles and the filing of INDs, just so that when you go into a biotech company, you speak their language. And I can tell you in my first experience, I hadn't got a clue. So it was kind of cool to look at this and say, wouldn't it be nice before go making that transition to actually start to understand these terms? Clinical development, I knew nothing of clinical development. I just knew that drugs went through clinical trials. But what does that look like? What is product registration and approval? How does a company end up getting reimbursed for all the hundreds of millions that these clinical trials are going to cost? That's when you start to look at pharmacoeconomics. And you know, one of the speakers today at the BioCanorex meeting, Chris Nichols from Merck, he was talking about reimbursement issues and how that drives decisions that his company makes. And I did not realize that once your drug is approved, it takes 15 to 44 months before you see any money. So for a small biotech who has spent everything they've got to get a drug to market, things can be really, really tough. And that's why you have to understand what that market is like. And I will say it's also um, very different to academia in as much as biotech goes through highs and lows. And in, in, in a way you can't take it personally if your company decides that they have to let people go. The pharmacoeconomics is what drives where your company is going. Now, I love this funny looking slide. I have to say there are people that don't love it, but I have found that people like me that have done a lot of target validation do like it. And I remember presenting it uh, to someone, Ali Ardakani, and he said, oh, I just love this slide. Do you mind if I use it? And I had just been told by someone that it was the worst slide they'd seen. I love it. And uh, the reason I've included it here, one of the things we did with the Bioinnovation Program, we decided to make some content of our own. And what we did is we made an integration workshop around the target product profile. Even in Admare, when we're looking at an opportunity for a new program to bring it in, we have to develop a target product profile. What is the target audience? What is the market share like? Is this a place where we want to spend our money? Now, one of the things we cover off in, in this, um, this workshop with our Senior Director of Project Management, Doug Erfel, is that when you're down here in a company, phase two, phase three, phase three, you're now $500 million in. When you get a failure here, it goes back here it goes back to those folks at the bench doing the early work. And you know, often my own experience, these are the folks people forget to listen to. These are the folks that can make a difference to a company. And that's where I always encourage people that are going into to biotech, find your voice because you can make a difference here by what you do here. And I'll give you one example of that. 
A local company here, Anamed, was developing an anti-HIV drug. One of the girls at the bench, she noticed that when she added the drug to her cells, the cells changed their behavior. She didn't keep that to herself. She made sure the CEO knew about it. What they did then, they launched an investigation of why that was the case. And it turned out that this particular drug mobilized stem cells to differentiate. They changed the entire trajectory of the company from an HIV drug to a drug called Mosabil. Mosabil now is on the market to treat neutropenic patients with chemotherapy uh, because they have no stem cells that are rapidly um, changing form. Uh, and also it is used for patients who've had their bone marrow ablated um, because they have leukemia and they're having a stem cell transplant. So in those two patient cohorts, you're likely to be treated in, in Canada with Mosabil. But the other part of that was that led to the company being sold to Genzyme for half a billion dollars. That person here made really their company half a billion dollars. I mean, that, that to me speaks to the power of being a curious scientist at the bench. So we created this program so that we could really encourage those that are transitioning to know that you're actually a really important person in terms of drug development. Now I mentioned our postdoctoral program and just some numbers here. 96% of our postdoctoral alumni are now successfully employed in top life sciences organizations. 83% of those are in Canada. Some are in the, the US, some are in various parts of Europe, including Ireland and, and England. Of those that are here, some of them have amazing careers. So Simvivo, uh, recently announced they've gone into phase one trials for their COVID vaccine. Uh, their vice president of R&D was one of our postdocs. Imagine now that's the position you hold. Another company that's constantly in the news is Precision Nanosystems. They're actually working on developing a gene therapy um, that, that can be delivered using their uh, liposomal nanoparticles. Their CEO, was one of our postdocs, one of our early postdocs. He's now the CEO of a company that is spoken about all over the world because of the Pfizer vaccine. And we have numerous of our uh, alumni are in uh, Zymeworks, BC Cancer. One of my postdocs is actually um, in the POG program, um, the personalized onco oncogenomics. A lot of what she learned in my lab enabled her to go to Steve Jones and say, I'd really love to be part of this program. So what I would hope for all of you, uh, that you would consider joining the Bioinnovation Scientist Program, interacting on the community and figuring out where are you going? Where on this could your future be? And just to say that uh, one of um, uh, uh, participants that has been through the program is Angela Zhao. She is a research administrator as part of the precision medicine team in the U of T. And she had some wonderful thoughts to say about the program. She said it, she found it. And I, I'll just say that the reason she took this was that uh, the precision medicine team was interested in the bioinnovation program, but they wanted her to take it and report back. Is this something we would want to offer to our students? And, and indeed they did. And we had a huge cohort sign up and we've just done it again with this year's cohort. She said it was an insightful experience in understanding the diversity of skills involved in accelerating science from the bench to commercialization. This program allowed her to develop a whole new set of skills that she believes will be helpful in her current role with Prime as well as in her future career. And I could tell you, I could probably put 10 such slides up 
from previous participants and, and the feedback that they've given us on the program and the difference that it has made to their careers. So we're very proud of that. And that really is all the slides I have. Um, I, you can find me uh, and add Mari on Twitter, but I'm on there too. You can find me on LinkedIn and very open to people uh, connecting with me, but very interested to hear what questions you might have. Okay, thanks, Eddie. It was really, really very informative presentation. And I am, when you were giving this presentation, I was just thinking, I really wished I could know this before our postdoc program. Instead of like, you know, going to another institute, I could join this one. I mean, it's so good. So like you, uh, I'm, you can find so many collaborations, you can learn so many skills, professional development skills also, in addition to your research skills or scientific skills. And that's the beauty of this program. So we are having actually some questions and then I have also one question. Shall I stop sharing my screen? Yeah. <laughs> That's we can, you can yeah. That. Okay, let me put like a uh, speaker view. Okay. So first question is how competitive is the postdoc program? Extremely competitive. Um, when I was in the lab, so I, I'm now full time on this program. Uh, prior to the pandemic, I had a lab um, here, the Division of Target Validation, and I can tell you every time I put a postdoc opportunity out, um, I would get dozens of applications, and I don't think that that has changed. But this is where the networking comes in. When you're a part of the community, you'll be the first person to see that something has been posted. Um, it will give you an opportunity to maybe connect with someone that's on that team. One of the most recent uh, postdoc offerings, I had at least six people connect with me and ask me to introduce them to the, any of the project leads that were looking for postdocs. It's networking. You, got to network, you've got to know what it is that you could bring to the job. So the more that you are online and connecting and understanding what we're looking for, the better your chances of getting it. Uh, thanks. I think networking is a very plus point here, like when you're submitting your applications. Uh, we have one more question. And that question is how much time commitment is necessary for the BIS? program so, one program yeah yes one program yeah so it's definitely self-managed uh we think that it's around 55 hours in total we've had some people come and steam through it i've had a few of our internal folks say when they put a gel on they just put one of the modules on so, or, or there's one of our scientists, she does a lot of flow cytometry. She knows she is stuck in that room for the afternoon. So she has the flow machine running and she's doing the BIS. She actually was one of the fastest to ever get through it. You know, it's, it's, it's tough to say what the average is because everyone has a different situation. I find I have a lot of participants that have young children. So weekends is definitely out for them. They're not going to be spending an hour looking at a, a, a module when they could be with their children. But they may have time in the lab then when they can actually spend that time. So I think that if you bargain on it being about 55 hours, you should be able to finish in under six months. Um, thanks, Adi. I think that's uh, it. So it means that it is completely virtual it's not in person or it's not hybrid right okay that i think that's really good because many people then can take advantage of this program and can definitely learn a lot so before i go to next question i would like to tell everyone that colleen has posted some links in the chat box one link is about admire bioinnovation online academy one link is about this program bio innovation scientific uh, scientist program and the one link is their LinkedIn page for Admire by Innovation. You can follow on LinkedIn so that you can uh, keep yourself updated. One more question from audience is, how long uh, does one have access to the training program? I don't know what does she mean by, uh, maybe you get it. Yeah, so, you know, sometimes we've had people sign up and then they disappear for a while. 
And what we try and do is drop an email and say, we notice you haven't been involved use because when, when you sign someone up for a program, you assign a license to them. And if it goes to waste, that's kind of a shame. And so we would maybe six months down the, the, the road say, you know, do you actually want to do the program? Uh, and sometimes it's just purely how busy life has been. So we are not here to make it any harder. Life is tough enough. We're busy enough. If someone was to interact with us and say, you know, this is going to take me a lot longer to do, we're fine. We're fine. We're there to serve you with this program. Uh, one of the things that I've started doing when I first do the acceptance email, I do request that people do at least the first module in the first four weeks because it shows us that they've made a commitment and that they are actually interested. And so, you know, but other than that, it's, it's down to what time you have. Okay, thanks. I think that's very nice, actually, that uh, like regarding time flexibility, it's very important. Most of us are either studying or doing the full time yeah. jobs. So it makes sense. We have one more question. Uh, could you please elaborate on the application process for this program? So the app, we've made it as easy as possible. Uh, we don't want it to be onerous. Uh, we want to know what your background is in terms of education. Um, we would prefer you already have your bachelor's. We have allowed some uh, that are not quite finished their bachelor's to do the program, mainly because they were so excited by it and really push to get on. And, and I think, well, that's exactly who we're looking for. Um, but in the application process, um, we, we're just being clear with you what your responsibility is. Do you have time to do this? Uh, what is your goal? Why do you want to do it? So it, it's actually a one pager. It's very, very simple. From the very beginning, we felt that this was not to be something that you had to jump over hoops to get into. We also decided that this is completely without cost to anyone in Canada. And we include all international students. And you know, they get left out of a lot of stuff. They pay a lot of money to be here. No, this is for you too. You have the same opportunity to take. Um, uh, and that was something that was very dear to me that no, anyone that is in our community of scientists in Canada has access to this program. It's not a, it's not a tough, um, thing to fill in. I think, you know, sometimes after I've presented within 15 minutes, I'll have an application. So it can't be that hard. I think maybe I will think about submitting it. And I really appreciate Admire by Innovations, this initiative, because it's it will help a lot. As you said, that there is no application fee. It's so beautiful thing to do. Most of us who are working, like students, in fact, they don't get so much stipend, you know, so they they cannot get these opportunities for their professional growth programs. And I really admire and appreciate this initiative. And I, um, I will try my best also to promote it as much as I can, because it is for the betterment of community. I have one question before I go to the audience questions. My question is about the executive program, like the last yeah. thing that you showed. Uh, to reach to that step, does one have to go through all the steps? Or if someone has already gone through those steps, like the scientific developments, and one can enroll only for that executive leadership program? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, and, and that's a little bit of a different program. Um, prior to the pandemic, it was in person. Um, so it's, it's, it's very different how it's put together. And it was in operation before we had the Bioinnovation Scientist Program. It's really for those emerging leaders, those that are now the postdocs that I've spoke about that are already senior directors. They're um, already leading large teams. The Bioinnovation Scientist Program is really aimed at those postdocs, PhDs, bachelors, masters, who are just trying to transition into an early career position. It's perfect for them. The folks that apply to the Executive Institute, 
they're probably 15, 10, 15 years already in their career. They, they've been around. And um, so, yeah, I, I don't know that we have had anyone in the Executive Institute that's gone through the Bioinnovation Scientist program because one came before the other. Thanks for elaborating this. I We have one more question. A Canadian who is outside of Canada can take this program too, I think. Uh, yeah, right? Or so, uh, well, it, everything is on a case by case basis. It's, if someone has left Canada and is making their life somewhere else, that probably wouldn't work because what we're trying to do is develop the next generation of highly qualified personnel for the Canadian ecosystem. I have had occasions where uh, a Canadian is doing a fellowship elsewhere and wanted to take the um, program and they did and, and they've done very well and they're now back in Montreal. So, so that worked. I think that's the thing is that let's take everything on a case by case basis. Is if someone is out of the country for a short period of time, they may be planning to come back and initiate their career here. And I will also say, I've had a couple of participants that haven't yet moved here. And they have contacted me and said, I'm so desperate to get into the network. I really need this. I'm moving in six weeks time to Canada. Can I sign up? And, and of course they, they did. They're now here in Canada and uh, they are working towards finding you know, the right role for them. Thanks, Ari. Anyone else, if you have questions, please either raise your hand or unmute yourself or type the question in the chat box. Anyone else has any question? So I, I will have one question. Is there any plan in future to make this program hybrid, like in person and virtual or because of the pandemic situation, I think the virtual is a better opportunity to... I, I think BIS1 was always going to be virtual. Um, I don't know how many changes we'll make to that, whether we might have some symposia where we do have in-person attendees. I know that as we develop BIS level two, there are plans to have retreats where they, they would definitely be in, in, in person. But we're definitely in that, um, and, and I should say, we have an overarching director over all the academies. Her name is Erin Stashin. And really and truthfully, she's looking at all these ideas. How do we make this work? How, how can we make it work when a lot of the participants are the other side of the country? How do we do in person? Or do we do an in-person day here, but still have everyone from outside of Vancouver able to attend virtually. I think that she's giving those sort of ideas a lot of thought, um, but we're not quite there yet. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks, Eddie. So uh, anyone else, do you have any question? Yeah, there here we go. Another question came. When can we expect BIS level two, et cetera, to launch? So we've, we're pretty confident in the uh, curation of the science for that level. One of the things Erin has been really clear on is making sure that we're very comfortable and very happy with how BIS1 is going. We have large numbers of people on it and um, we don't wanna take our eye off the ball. We actually recently went through and amended some of the courses. Science is a moving target. Things are changing all the time. Like I said before, now half the drugs going to market are biologics. We now have to start thinking, how do we address that in the training that we're providing? So I think that we won't see BIS level two for some months to come. And what are we November? It could even be maybe next summer. There'll be a lot of uh, fanfare around it. There'll be a lot on social media about it. I'm very excited by it, but I'm really glad that uh, I have someone that is keeping us all. Oops, sorry. Sorry, that's my phone. Um, that we have someone that's really taking. Um, the initiative of making sure that BIS1 is what we want, 
before we then run down the road and do BIS2. Uh, thanks, Ari. I think we have one more question. Do your experience, what will happen to the most of people who take BIS level one program? I hope they'll develop the career that they want. And you know what? It's fine if that career is an academic career. There is great opportunities in academia to be part of international programs. And I think what I would hope is that as you go through the program, start thinking about what aspect of science turns that light on in your mind. Because you know, it, you may actually find that pure bench science is what you love. That can be fine for some biotechs, but it also can be fine for an academic role. I think this is like a, a program of discovery. What do you want to do? What do you see yourself doing? And let's be honest, scientists are the worst with imposter syndrome. They don't believe they belong. They don't, and, and I think especially, you know, women uh, and, and men that have emigrated here from other places who are looking to break in, you know, to um, uh, really another culture. I would hope that going through the BIS, you then start to believe in yourself and know that you have skills that are of value and start thinking about, well, what do I want to do? Instead of feeling that you're being squashed into a career that maybe you will not like. You're gonna work for decades. You're gonna work for an awful long time. And you may have two or three careers in that period. Thank you. Thanks, Ali, for this uh, elaborated answer. We, okay, before we move to the next question, I, we, I have one question. So if some, whenever Admare thinks about la launching uh, like a BIS level two program or level three program, then whoever is the applicant, the applicant has to go through all levels, all the app, depending on applicant's experience, they can apply to BIS level two directly. I personally think that we would have people go through BIS one. I think it sets the foundation of what you actually need to understand before you start looking at more complex issues. Because in BIS2, you will start to do electives that are actually quite complex. Now you're starting to look at things like digital learning, management of big data. Like now you're starting to look at way bigger concepts than is dealt with in BIS1. I think I would see that as as kind of the base that you need before you jump into two. Okay. Thank you. And one more question is that, uh, is, are these programs certified, for example, if someone takes BIS one level one, will that person, can that person get the certificate from Admire by Innovation that Academy that yes, that per person has completed these credit hours or these courses and it covers this, this, this thing or something like this? That is an excellent question. I couldn't have planted that question any better. It's something that we're very, very closely looking at right now that, uh, yeah, we absolutely want to be able to issue certification that people have undertaken this. And that is going to happen. And we will go back to those that have already moved on from the program and we'll send them their certificates. It's, it, 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 it's going to be very important that you have that acknowledgement because then you can add it to your resume. And then an employer knows that, oh, you've already got a background in this because you've taken this course. You know, our official launch was only in February this year. So it, it's just taking time to understand what is important. And I, I, I think certification is going to be very important. And that's something that I know Erin is looking at. Thanks, Eddie. Yeah, it's a pretty new program. I was uh, in February, so I think it's already doing so well, this program, because it has so much to offer, actually. Um, so now I will move to another question. Does a master's student whose major is chemistry, but without life sciences background, have the access to apply for this program? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. An engineer, a physicist, a chemist, 
Although we've joked over the years, you know, in my research, we always had the chemists at the meetings. They didn't understand what the biologist was saying and, and we didn't understand what they were saying. But of course, in this, it's a level playing field. You're a scientist. This is absolutely right for you. Okay, thank you. The next question is, can you describe uh, the difference in the outcome one would expect coming out of BIS level two, three versus level one. That is what type of the career opportunities these cohorts uh, be ready for? I think coming out of BIS one, you just start to have an understanding of what the world of biotechnology looks like, what your role is in it, what potential there is for you. You will have um, networked on our community. Those that go into BIS2, and that will be a much smaller number, that won't be wide open for hundreds of people, but they will have um, an additional opportunity to be mentored. And I think that that will be a great difference that, you know, and I would say anyone that's looking for developing their career in whatever field, look for mentors, Look for champions, look for people that believe in you. But that will be something that becomes part of level two. And so then you're starting to get hold of people that are going to take a real deep dive into information. And it's not for everyone. I think some people will finish BIS1 and think that is enough for me. I'm now going to develop my career and I'm very happy. Um, but for others who still want to carry on that learning journey, that will be a master's level program and will be a much bigger commitment. So you'd have to, you'd have to really think whether you wanted to, to give that amount of time to more study. You know, those of us that have done our grad studies, we've done a lot more schooling than a lot of other careers. And at, at some point, it, 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 it's tough to sign up for yet another program. Thanks, Eddie. Uh, anyone has any question? If you have, please, this is a time for you to ask questions. Please feel free to raise your hand or to unmute yourself or post a question in the chat box. If no, then probably we will close the session, we are already hitting 12.52. We are really in time. And um, as a closing remarks, I will give the floor to Ed, Dr. Dillahan. Eddie, if you would like to add something as a closing remarks. Okay, one Absolutely. question came up. Oh. So, <laughs> one question came just now. Do we have access to the recording? So it is for me. Yes, you will have access to the recording. I will, it's recorded and I will upload on Squeeze channel on weekend. These days are really crazy for me. I have to upload even the last session also. I will definitely do this weekend. Please come and check Squeeze channel by Monday and you will see recording of this session also and the previous session, our AMA session where uh, Dr. Delahan was our panelist. So you can get access to both of these recordings. That's it. So now I will give floor to Eddie to you for closing remarks. I would say to any of you, um, as you develop your career in the life sciences in Canada, reach out and join our community. Become part of what is driving um, Canada as, as, as a real beacon in the world for great research. Sign up for the Bioinnovation Bio Scientist Program. You, you will be very welcome. And also start to understand what it is that you actually bring to the table. And I think this is something that we're very bad at as scientists. If you've published a paper, you know how to take your data and communicate it. You know, make sure you really know that you have developed skills during your studies that sometimes no one ever acknowledges. But when you are going for a job, actually, it's very important that you can condense what it is you know you can bring to the table. And I think that that's where it's hard for um, postdocs and scientists to transition into biotechnology. They don't actually understand the skill set that they have already got. 
because you have already learned how to communicate. You've already learned to develop some of those soft skills that I can tell you the companies are desperate for. And that's what I would hope by being part of our community that we can teach you how to really present yourself in your career and know that you actually have more than you realize. Hopefully that helps. Thanks, Eddie. I think that was a really good message to uh, like helping in someone's personal development because uh, in many of us, we have lots of scientific skills, but when we have to present ourselves in front of the companies or interviews, many of us, we cannot do it in a better way. It's just like marketing your skills. And I think that's a very nice message. With that note, I would like to end this session for today. And it's my last event in Squeezed. <laughs> After this, I am not going to be in any Squeezed uh, event because I would be leaving by end of November. You'll be missed. Uh, yeah, I, I hope. <laughs> I will also miss all these people and networking. And this, this was amazing experience for me. I got to know so many good people. So I would like to wish all of you a very good evening, afternoon or night from wherever you are joining us. And have a great weekend. Enjoy. I don't know if it, it's going to be sunshine uh, like in your city. In Vancouver, we don't think so. We will have definitely some rains. So, but still enjoy the rain. If, even if it is raining, enjoy the rain, enjoy the snow and take care of yourself. And bye. See you some other time. Take care. Thank you, Noeen. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Eddie.